Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We are so excited to have you join this conversation today. Um, my name is Nadia Mohajer, and I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Camila Pickett. Assalamu alaikum. I'm excited to be here and have this conversation. Very excited. So today we're going to be starting the first of our three conversations on health equity in black and brown communities, black and brown Muslim communities to be exact. And as two organizations um, that are deeply committed to public health, we, uh, there are so many questions that we'll be exploring, including what is health and how you build trust with the community and what makes community-led initiatives so access successful. Right. And I am excited to, see, to have this conversation specifically because it needs to be had, right? Um, whenever you see community-led uh, initiatives, um, it is important to take a peek behind the curtain to see who's responsible for it, um, who's running programs, who they have consulted with, um, and really who their target audience is. And so I am all about um, transparency and accountability when it comes to community programming. And it's good to have a chance to kind of talk this through and to talk about what um, health looks like and should look like in 2019 in Muslim communities in the United States. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, before we begin, I thought it would be great if we just kind of share a little bit both about our organizations. Uh, and so I wanted to begin um, reintroducing myself. I'm Nadia, uh, founder and executive director of Heart Women and Girls. And we're a national uh, nonprofit that's working to promote sexual health literacy and sexual violence prevention in Muslim communities. And we do this in a bunch of ways, including um, health, having a health educational workshops, developing materials and videos, research, uh, conducting research with uh, local universities, and training other organizations and professionals to better serve Muslim communities' needs. And most of all, uh, we really want uh, to work to equip Muslims with the tools and the language that they need to achieve sexual health and address sexual violence while centering their identities, faith, and experiences. And I am director of Community Health Compass. Uh, the Community Health Compass is a health advocate training program that centers the experiences and needs of Black Muslim communities. Uh, and I chose to focus on the communities that I know. Um, we deserve to have programs that center us intentionally and unapologetically. It not only makes public health sense, but it's the right thing to do. Um, and so the Community Health Compass grew out of work that I was doing with a colleague of mine, Khadija Gurna. Um, we both have been in spaces where we were advocating on behalf of Muslim communities or advocating on behalf of Black communities um, in health-centered circles. And we were finding that we were the only people doing um, that work through our lens. Um, and so we decided to work together to do it intentionally. We did a lot of work uh, around the Affordable Care Act, getting um, Black Muslim communities enrolled. Um, and then I realized that more than trying to enroll people in healthcare, um, we needed to take a step back and talk about just access to healthcare in general um, and what that needed to look like for Black Muslim communities. Um, and so that's how the Community Health uh, Compass started. It's a living curriculum, and it's designed to be a guide to navigate um, healthcare in individual communities, right? Um, which is why I think this conversation is important. And so we've had workshops that talked about healthcare 101, like how to make a doctor's appointment, what to do when you show up, um, how to navigate paying for healthcare if you don't have insurance or if you have insurance. Um, and we've done classes about sexual health. And so um, I have a history with heart um, and I am happy to be um, collaborating for this. And we're really excited to have you um, join this conversation as well. And the work that you're doing is so critical. And you know, our stories are a little similar in how we started um, as well. Um, you know, just really identifying in our own local communities that we were living in and working in 
uh, some of the gaps that um, in, especially with respect to sexual health uh, knowledge and, um, edu and access to education, a lot of the people that we were working with were, um, were uh, reporting and disclosing to us that, you know, they didn't feel like they had access to information and services that were culturally responsive to their needs and that the existing um, resources that they could access, they felt, you know, um, a little bit uh, of resistance in, in sort of, uh, and hesitance in, in sort of accessing those um, due to some of the, the shame and stigma that was associated with, um, with sexual health and sexual violence. Um, and you know, uh, as we've continued to grow, we recognize our own sort of um, growing uh, growth areas, uh, especially with respect to the community, the diverse communities that we're trying to uh, reach. Uh, we are predominantly led by South Asian women. And so a lot of our work is reaching South Asian and immigrant folks. And that's why I am really uh, even more excited to have you, Camila, join this conversation um, and, and see how we can continue to collaborate and have our work um, sort of cross, um, cross, uh, you know, reach other communities and things like that. And, it, and it's important to acknowledge in conversations that we've had in the past about the work that we do and the work that Heart does. Um, I have found you very forthcoming and being willing to have conversations about blind spots, right? And that doesn't happen a lot. Um, but it's important when you're doing community-led work to acknowledge what you know and what you don't know um, and where blind spots exist um, and being willing to take a step back and examine that when it's pointed out to you. Um, so I appreciate that I've been able to have conversations about the space that heart occupies um, and how to better navigate the entire landscape of sexual health for all Muslim women, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't have a problem at all with an organization focusing specifically on South Asian women. They need to have that focus, right? Um, but I think that sometimes what happens in the United States, uh, especially when we talk about Muslims, um, as as Muslims, we don't like to be racialized, but we do it to ourselves. And so we start taking the language of like, Muslim means this. Um, and we can't fall into the trap of boxing in or boxing out our, you know, sisters and brothers in the name of expediency or, you know, for short language, because language matters. And so there is no one Muslim community as much as that sounds good, and we would like that to be the case, there isn't. There are Muslim communities. Um, we all experience um, it differently in the United States, and specifically because of the history of how this country was founded. Um, our uh, experience as Muslims may be shaded by the political environment, right? Um, but this isn't new especially for Black Muslims. Um, we have a long history in this country of being um, victimized and brutalized because of our race and ethnicity, and also because of our religion that predates September 11th, um, that predates uh, the current political environment we find ourselves in. And so that means that we experience things differently, and we particularly experience access to healthcare and the healthcare um, system differently. Um, and so, and having conversations about um, even sexual health, there are things that we experience differently. And that has to be, um, if not the specific focus of, of any of your organization, that has to be the focus of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be acknowledged. So I appreciate you having that conversation. Um, and that is why we're working together to do this. Yeah, and I I really want to echo your uh, thoughts on you know the difference between Muslim community and Muslim communities. Uh, it's definitely something that in the past um, you know last maybe five years six years we have actually made very intentional uh, decision to actually transition to that language as well. Um, you know I think it's I think. Uh, 
uh, mainstream media uses it, right? Mainstream media always uses the Muslim community. And then um, also when Muslims are talking about their the own communities that they live and work in, they often fall into the trap of using the word Muslim community. And like you said, that that does result in boxing people in and uh, and also this conversation around who's a Muslim and who's not, who belongs and who not, who, who doesn't. And I think that that, you know, um, the politicking around that can get really complicated um, for people who have a group of people who have, who can be as diverse as you can possibly get <laughs> in the United States of America in particular. Right. Um, you know, and so I think, um, I think that, uh, it, that has been something, a commitment on my part that I've made whenever I speak about the work and we talk about Muslim communities, you know, and just the fact that uh, we can't have a one size fits all approach at all. Uh, and that's sort of why our work sort of emerged in the first place is that we were recognizing in the own, in our own um, immigrant and South Asian um, communities that we were working in, it wasn't working for them either. The, the you know, the one size fits all approach. And once you go beyond the South Asian community or the Arab community, it's, it's even more um, of a need to have um, a very unique and culturally responsive approach. And even when you look at South Asian communities and Arab communities, within those communities, there's so much diversity even uh, with respect to, you know, geography and socioeconomics and, um, and, um, uh, even religious practice that I think it, it, it's, it's just something that we always have to consider when we're, when we're thinking about any health intervention that is targeting Muslim communities. Absolutely. And, you know, it's important for us to find common ground where we can. Um, but I, I will make this point. I think a lot of times um, the conversations that you, well, the conversation that I have have seen emerging uh, on social media um, is really trying to uh, make this distinction between um, your practice as a Muslim, like as a religion, uh, and then the work you do, whether you do, you know, social act activism or anything that you do like there has to be this gap or this break between the two and while theologically that might have some merit and then probably doesn't but maybe so let's say for the sake of argument that it does in reality that's not how we experience our lives um i am black and muslim and woman at the same time all the time you know and I don't find incongruity in any of those identities um, and how I move through the world and how I live, how I practice my faith, how I do the work that I do. Um, and so we have to meet people where they are, especially in terms of pe public health. Um, that is just the most important thing. We can't, you can't take into it um, ideals of how people should be, um, you know, based on a theological standard, you have to meet people where they are. Um, that's, that's the only way that any public health intervention will be effective. Uh, and we can't um, look at things and say, well, you know, we shouldn't be making these distinctions, these, you know, racial and ethnic distinctions as Muslims, because, you know, there is no racism in Islam. And it's like, well, but Islam is a theology, right? Muslims, the people who practice that, oh, we got racism everywhere. It's kind of embedded in this society and how we have, we have grouped ourselves and how we function. And to dismiss that or to not acknowledge it is just ridiculous. Um, and it doesn't help anything. So this is not you know, a statement of victimhood. It's not a statement of like perpetual, um, like perpetually being downtrodden, it's just the way it is. Um, and in order to have health equity, we have to start at racial and ethnic equity, right? That's the basis of health equity. And you can improve health outcomes for different types of communities 
and still see a huge gap between um, race and ethnicity. Uh, and that isn't, um, that isn't the outcome I'm comfortable with, right? So that's the baseline that we're starting at. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that before we move on. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of Camila's statement to all of the haters, just from jump. Like, I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Um, and we can't, you can't dismiss it and say, oh, well, we don't have to make those distinctions. Yes, we absolutely do have to make them. Um, because there are systems of, of oppression that are not, you know, just things that social justice people made up um, to talk, you know, on Twitter or Facebook. They're very real. Um, and whether it is interpersonal racism or internalized or institutional or structural, they exist. Um, and they, the way that they function um, colors how we as black and brown Muslim women are able to access healthcare. And healthcare and our ability to access it and to have um, programs or, or interventions that are specific to us is a matter of life and death. Absolutely, uh, completely agree. Uh, and you know, and I think. I am feeling hopeful that, you know, especially in, in particular, the public health community is moving toward that understanding of what it looks like to acknowledge the multiple identities and multiple lived experiences that people can walk into a hospital or healthcare facility with, uh, and really trying to be very innovative and creative uh, with respect to addressing, you know, uh, and we're going to get into the weeds of this a little, but, you know, the social determinants of health and how identity can actually play a role in, in one's ability to access healthcare and then also to benefit from healthcare. Uh, and so um, I'm feeling hopeful that they're moving in that direction, but, and there's a lot more work to be done. So, uh, so I'm really excited to be having this conversation. Um, before we we get into the weeds of this conversation, I, I thought it would be important to sort of think about shared language and what words are we going to be using a lot to kind of set a foundational understanding of this of this conversation as it gets more and more complex. Absolutely. So uh, what what words or concepts uh, are you thinking are key to having this conversation? Um, so I talked about systems of oppression, which is basically like forms of uh, racism. Uh, and I use definitions that are based on the work of Dr. Kamara Jones, um, who is now at Morehouse uh, School of Health, School of Medicine. Um, I'm saying School of Medicine because that's where I got my master's in public health. So <laughs> I'm basing this on the work of Dr. Kamara Jones. Um, and she identifies three types of racism. There's interpersonal, which is personally mediated individual behavior. And that's based on like assumptions that you make about the motives and intentions of others by race. Uh, there's internalized, which is acceptance by um, the stigmatized race of negative messages and um, abil uh, negative messages about basically your intrinsic worth and your abilities. Um, but then the biggest form uh, and the one that I focus more on is institutional and structural and that is racism that is produced and maintained by policies and practices um, and that is reinforced by um, dominant U.S. norms and values and so I look at it like this if um, the system as we see it is like a bird cage then institutions are the individual bars that make up that cage. Um, and then outside of all of that, kind of surrounding it like a fog, is white privilege. So those are kind of the systems of oppression. Um, I think another term that you used was um, the social determinants of health. Uh, and that is, social determinants of health are, um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of them, but it's things like income and social status, your employment and working conditions, um, there's your education, social supports and coping skills, your access to services, there's 
a bunch of them. Those um, are kind of circumstances that um, impact how healthy communities are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to also uh, challenge everyone who's watching this conversation to really think about, you mentioned white privilege and how, you know, that's, that's uh, um, a fog that surrounds all of the systemic oppression and really thinking, challenging folks to think about white privilege in a way that, yes, you know, uh, white privilege generally refers to the privilege, the unearned privileges that people who are white um, walk around in life with, right? And that certain communities uh, or certain identities can also kind of embody white privilege, right? So for example, light-skinned folks or white passing folks. So people of color who might be white passing may also um, have um, white privilege. Um, you know, and so uh, I think this this is an important thing to consider in terms of this concept of at any one point in time, someone can have be privileged and marginalized at the same time. It can be a both and. And I think that that is something really important to think about. And, you know, uh, having white privilege in and of itself is not, um, it's not an insult, it's just a reality. And uh, to think about, you know, uh, a person, um, you know, a lot of times uh, people are like, well, I, I have white privilege. Yes, I'm white and I'm poor. So, you know, and it's, and it's kind of like, yes, and it can be both. You can have that white privilege and that is giving you certain privileges and advantages in the way that the world receives you and in the way that the world um, interacts with you. And you can also be marginalized due to your income or due to your um, circumstances in your life that can also, you know, perhaps cause barriers to certain um, uh, services that you might be looking for. And so I think it's important to, to, to point out here that poverty um, is not a proxy for race or ethnicity. And a lot of times um, policymakers use it as such. It is not. Uh, and it's kind of like this. In the United States, um, our entire system of laws um, has, has racial oppression built into it, right? And the very founding of our country um, set up a, uh, a dichotomy of race um, where on one end you had enslaved Africans um, and also um, the people indigenous to this land. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had white people. Um, and every group that was introduced um, was placed somewhere on that spectrum, either closer to uh, those who had been enslaved or the indigenous people who had um, been, you know, subject to genocide or closer to the white people who had codified these laws. Um, and so it's an entire spectrum. And yes, you can be white and poor. Um, you can um, be white and struggle. You can be white and have all sorts of horrible things happen to you that, you know, may be a function of where you live, um, and what you have access to. But your struggle is not based on um, simply the color of your skin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that means that the way that class and gender and sexual orientation or gender identity, um, religion, language, all of those things um, are kind of uh, floating around the issue of race, mm -hmm. at least in the United States, how we experience it, right? And you can't talk about disparities in any of those um, categories without starting with race, because at the heart of it, um, in this country, Black people will experience 
all of those things differently based on our race and ethnicity, period. Um, so that's that. <laughs> Uh, and I think another term that uh, I hear a lot is uh, like POC, people of color. Um, and while there are things that we, we might experience that are similar, that term is very broad, uh, right? And I don't, um, just like, you know, Muslim is not uh, a race or ethnicity and like poverty is not a proxy for race. Um, we can't use the blanket term people of color to refer to, you know, black people and South Asian people and Latinx people, like say what you mean when you're talking, when you're talking about, right? Like make that distinction, whoever it is you're talking about, whatever group you're talking about, just say that. Um, because we experience things differently. And I think it, um, it causes a lot of confusion and it, in trauma, when people lump it all together, right? Because like you said, there are people of color, people who consider themselves people of color, who can, um, who can uh, revel in some level at least, uh, if not white privilege, um, closeness to that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, and they can visit those traumas upon other people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a fan of just, saying what you mean. Yeah. And, you know, people of color, black and brown communities, even when black and brown communities are lumped together, I think that that is to a certain degree doing a disservice. Uh, and, you know, um, it, the intergenerational trauma and historical trauma, especially of slavery uh, uh, in, in this country on black people is incomparable to other brown communities. And so I think, you know, lumping them together and talking about even, I know it's, it, like you said, it's it's easy, it's simple, it, it, it makes things shorter to just say, hey, we're talking about black and brown communities, but I do think that there is a difference and uh, it's really important to keep uplifting that and acknowledging that, that uh, we may be talking about quote unquote minorities in this community or in this country. And that being said, within that, there's a whole range of experiences that are not alike at all. Um, and that and I know some people are gonna say like, why are they talking about this like in a healthcare video? Like, what does this have to do with healthcare? Um, and I kinda gotta say, if you have to ask that question, that's why we're talking about it, right? Um, because black people um, have a, we have a very wicked history with healthcare in this country. Um, and some very awful things have been visited upon our communities in the name of research and science um, under the guise of healthcare. Um, and so we have every right to mm -hmm. be suspicious um, and distrustful of the healthcare system. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to access healthcare, right? That doesn't mean that we don't need to go to a doctor if we break a bone or we don't need treatment if we have cancer, but how do we navigate that having a deep mistrust, right? And it's not um, always um, a distrust that you can even name. Some of it is just historical trauma um, and, and things that were kind of passed down and uh, ways of coping and dealing with that. Uh, and that's why it's important to acknowledge and to, to state that very clearly at the beginning so that when we get into the conversation, um, it makes sense. And I, I actually appreciate you also bringing that up about the deep history that Black communities in particular have with healthcare. It's something that is almost erased, right? And uh, most people don't know. Most people don't know of some of the horrifying um, experimentations and uh, in the name of research things that happened in the medical field to black communities. And so I'm glad you brought that up and we're gonna be talking about it in detail in conversation yeah. two, uh, actually you know, naming some of the very important uh, historical moments uh, where uh, that kind of led to this sort of um, 
deep mistrust and, and understandable deep mistrust. And so, uh, again, I think it's important to uplift all of that because a lot, even doctors, it's really, it's really interesting. Even a lot of doctors don't know some of this history and, uh, and that that's a shame because that, you know, implicit bias, bias is real and it, it, uh, absolutely always at play, uh, during any healthcare delivery, uh, situation. And so for doctors not to be even more aware of that historical trauma and have almost a trauma-informed approach to when they are uh, treating um, Black communities, I think, I think it's a disservice. And I think that it is a conversation to be had with, with the healthcare industry as well to see, you know, uh, when that's going to change. And, you know, and everything is not everything isn't trauma, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to, to give the impression that everything is trauma sure. and everything is heavy. Um, that's part of it. Um, but then another part of it is that in the face of, of trauma, in the face of distrust, um, Black communities and Black Muslim communities in particular have developed do-for-self do attitudes. Um, when it comes to everything, but even healthcare. Um, and so people figured out ways to survive. They figured out ways to care for themselves, to care for their families, um, and to be really adept at doing so. Uh, Black Muslim communities have a long history of doing that in this country. Um, and so, you know, there are whole systems put in place uh, that what do you do if you can't go to the doctor, if you don't trust the, your local doctor, if you, don't, if you don't have the money to pay for healthcare, what do you do? Um, and so Black Muslim communities in particular have always answered that question by, you figure out a way to do it yourself. Um, whether it is concepts of what to eat to stay healthy, um, what naturopathic remedies can be used for you know things that are amenable to such and you know f sending two or three people to go to medical school right to be community doctors the people to come back so that you have people that you do trust um and people that will interrogate the system as it is um so that it eventually functions as it should I think this is a really interesting segue to uh, the next part of our conversation with respect to what are the barriers to this sort of community engagement. And, you know, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, you named one of them, which is building trust, right? And, and really thinking about what does building trust look like uh, in um, Black communities um, and, you know, other communities as well. Uh, what does... Um, what needs to happen in order for uh, this trust to be built, in order for uh, something to be community-led, et cetera? Um, I think probably the, the, the basis for building trust um, is conversation. Uh, it's to see yourself in the types of uh, public conversations that are happening um, if you don't see yourself represented in the public sphere around a particular problem or a solution, then how do you see yourself with regards to that, right? Um, when you see other people representing you and they're from groups that have contributed to your oppression or contributed to the problem, that's not going to work, right? Uh, so there is um, the notion of having true representation that is not just diversity um that is that is past that um so there's the there's a feeling of kind of like well if you get different faces at a table then a problem will automatically work itself out um and that is not true and it's just kind of like the first step towards full equity is diversity um, the second step would be like inclusion, giving people, uh, not giving people, but allowing people the voice um, and the power to, to voice their opinions and to make actual impact 
at whatever proverbial table they're sitting at. But, but beyond that is actual equity. And that is closing racial and ethnic gaps that exist. So I think if you start at diversity, it's really easy to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of pat yourself on the back and think you've done a good job. If you look around the table and it looks like a gap ad, then you figure, oh, good job, right? Like I've checked one of each box doing something good. Um, I think if you start at equity as the goal um, of closing gaps, then you automatically have to be diverse and you have to be inclusive, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of where I start with that. Um, but then I noticed that a, a big barrier that I saw when doing um, other public health work, uh, when I was being called to different tables, um, representing like, you know, Muslim communities, is that I would get there, uh, especially if it was faith-based groups, I would get there and there would be like maybe three Muslims, um, and a large group of faith-based workers, right? Problem number one. Um, and then I would be the only Black Muslim. And then, you know, the talk would be about, you know, centering um, public health initiatives in churches and synagogues and masjids. And I was like, that's great. And maybe that has worked in the past, but what about people who don't go to those places, right? Like, what about Muslims who are unmasked? Um, if they are not connected to a particular masjid or a particular community beyond maybe Ramadan and Eid, then what happens to them? Are they not, you know, worthy of, of these interventions, right? Are they not included in the community that you're talking about? Because I gotta tell you, if you're just going to the masjid, you're only getting a small slice of of any Muslim community, right? And so I will pose these questions and people will be giving me a look like, but you're the Muslim and that's why we brought you in to talk about how to go to the masjid. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm not that Muslim then because the people that, you know, that I see um, are everywhere. And so another uh, rule of community, community engagement is going where people are. Um, and being fine with that, right? Like you're not necessarily trying to draw people where you are or where you think they should be, but you're actually going to where they are. And instead of going in and telling people like you have this problem or you have that issue and this is what you need to do to fix it, you just go and listen um, without any assumptions, but with the intention to do good as the community sees it and experiences it mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing that you will probably fail <laughs> the first couple of times right but that's okay because that's part of the process um, and so i think a, a lot of us are hesitant to do that because it's not glamorous um it, it requires you to like let go of your ego it's super hard it's like thankless work um, but it's, it's super important. Um, and when, when people, in my experience, when people see that you are willing to do that, then that builds trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, as public health, you know, practitioners, like we don't ever go into communities, like waving solutions, like this is what you should do. Um, and here, take this. It's like, no, you're trying to build um, not just ownership of any one initiative, but um, you're, you're building capacity for communities to do it themselves, uh, to decide what is and isn't a problem, and then to decide how to best tackle it in their community. And that goes a long way to building trust. You use the resources or skill that you have for the benefit of other people and you kind of take yourself out of it um yeah I think I think you brought up there's so many things I want to say to this I think I think you brought up some really important uh points that actually bring us back to our original point right about 
the diversity of Muslim communities. And so when we're talking about like faith-based initiatives that arise and it's like all people of church and mosques and all of that, and like, we're going to save, you know, uh, Muslims today by, you know, doing this breast cancer screening <laughs> at the mosque, right? And then reminding them that like, hey, only 10% of Muslims actually go to mosques or feel safe right. going to mosques, right? Um, so there's that. Like, yes, only like that amount of people are going to churches and synagogues. Absolutely, like, absolutely, absolutely. Right? Keep it real. Let's so just... it's like, it's, it's acknowledging that not to say that those people aren't important to reach. Like, absolutely. You should have a breast screening, um, you know, intervention at a mosque. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. You will be reaching women and men who, you know, otherwise may not have um, known about that. And it's important to recognize the rise of these third spaces, the rise of different communities where, uh, you know, self-organized uh, Muslims can identify and feel belonging in and often those are the harder communities to engage and build trust with and because there's so much distrust between those two groups and a lot of it does fall back into the theological conversations right and who is a muslim and who is not and who belongs and who is not but you know but what about your religious practice etc and um and i will challenge folks who are watching this to consider that sometimes that that decision not to go beyond the mosque is actually um, a decision based on power and privilege and and who actually holds power and privilege which identities hold power and privilege in within muslim communities and i think that that is something uh really important to explore and and think about um in terms of our our sort of uh, commitment to equity um right. And then it doesn't have to be either or, right? It needs to be and. Exactly. I'm saying, and, like, you can have it at masjid, and you can also have it at community centers, right? Yeah. And you can have it any other place where people have congregated um, and they feel safe. Yeah. Any of those places. Even if it's, you know, if it's at somebody's home, um, if that is a place that is getting a number of, of, of Muslim um, black Muslim women to come together to talk about something, then absolutely that's where you go, right? You go wherever those proverbial tables exist. Like, it's not all about you inviting people to your table, it's you going to theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and people find a way. Like, um, there are people that are disconnected from communities um, for all of those reasons that you mentioned, right? And they are the hardest people to reach. Um, that's why it takes effort. Mm -hmm. And it takes thinking um, more broadly about what our communities look like. And if we don't take that step first, then we just miss a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and we miss it to our own detriment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a difference between like authentic trust building, authentic inclusion, and like tokenization. Mm -hmm. um, and organizations and individuals, like those are our landmines we kind of have to navigate. Um, which is why I said like, sometimes it will fail. <laughs> sometimes it will go horribly wrong. Um, but even in that is a lesson. Uh, and I think that um, that is what I enjoy most about public health advocacy is that there is always a lesson uh, and the lesson helps for the next intervention, whatever that is. Yeah, and you know, uh, these are questions that we explore at heart every day, especially around the, you know, what does it mean? What is the difference between tokenization and authentic inclusion? And when do we cross over? to from tokenization to authentic inclusion right and you know there's no set formula there's no um there's no cookie cutter sort of recipe that i can give you all that will you know say if you follow this to the t you will be moving towards authentic inclusion but some of the lessons that we've learned is you know um really thinking about this concept of intersectionality that you brought up earlier and making sure that folks can bring all of their identities you know, um, however complex the decision, or not decision, the discussion can become with those um, identities 
they should all be able to be in that space, able to be centered, able to be, you know, addressed um, in a way that is holistic and not in a way that's making them compartmentalize again, their identities. Um, thinking about what it looks like to have interventions that are healing centered, that are really acknowledging the history um, of the group of folks that you want to engage and, and, and sort of work alongside. Thinking about what it would mean, you know, to address um, their needs for healing and their needs to, uh, you know, feel ownership over this. And, and really definitely what you, what you said about, you know, moving from diversity to inclusion really also thinks about what does that look like for um, internally in an organization or in a community in terms of who's in leadership and who is um, being able to sort of lead the work and own the work and, um, and really uh, embody it in a way that is not just, oh, you know, this is just my staff who's leading it, but it's really some other person's accolades and, and achievements and things like that. Right. Um, Cause you have to model that as an organization, right? <laughs> Cause there's, it's, uh, that would be kind of, uh, kind of ridiculous to um, lead a campaign and then not be modeling that same behavior internally. Uh, and that happens all the time though. <laughs> that happens all the time. <laughs> and and you, so can many tell, you can tell and communities can tell, right? People can tell um ultimately who who is behind something uh and i think that that goes back to um just being authentic about what it is you're trying to do uh and saying exactly what your intentions are like just being super clear about who it is that you're targeting and why uh and understanding that you know if people aren't feeling you they just aren't feeling you. And they're the whole notion of like, oh, well, I really wish uh, our communities would talk about this or X, Y, or Z, and nobody is talking about this or nobody is doing this work is a very kind of arrogant statement because people are always talking about it. People are always doing it on some level. Um, you just don't know about it. Mm -hmm. It may not be widespread, um, but even the, the, the notion of talking about sexual health, right, right? the work that Hart does, um, I grew up with Black Muslim women doing that type of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, they didn't have an organization, they just did it. Um, so, you know, it was nothing that was uh, structured, they didn't have funding, they were just women who took it upon themselves to have these conversations and to be the people in the community that um, young girls could go to when they were growing up and had questions about things or being, you know, the older women in the community that um, would have frank conversations and would give information. Um, and I know that super intimately because my mother was one of those women and she still is, right? So um people are always having the conversations that we you know we like to decry that are not being had enough um they may not have the amplification mm -hmm. that that we have as organizations um maybe they don't want it right like maybe they're comfortable um having an impact amongst their circle um both types of communication, I mean, both types of uh, engagements are important. Um, and it's important for us to acknowledge all of that because that's how we develop um, a community health, right? Like that's what it looks like. It looks like um, individuals taking ownership of their health um, and their access to healthcare it looks like individuals having a concern for the people in their family and being able to navigate it for their family, um, whether it is their blood family or their chosen family. It looks like uh, it, it looks like larger interventions that are led with all of these things in mind, right? That are 
targeted to close specific gaps, specific racial and ethnic gaps. Um, it looks like uh, interventions that are targeted for specific health conditions that keep in mind um, the complexities of communities, right? That whatever you're doing, even if it's a, if it's a diabetes program, you're like, well, that's pretty simple. You know, there's a, there's a template for that. Like, yeah, there's a template for that, but that doesn't fit for everybody, right? Like how you talk about diet is different um, in a Black community than it is in a South uh, Asian community than it is in a Latinx community, right? The breadth of Latinx communities, right? Like what you what you tell people they can put on their plate to mm-hmm. keep healthy. Those vary widely. And I think that, you know, some government programs have, have recognized that. Um, but there's still a long way to go. And so as Muslim women who are public health practitioners, it's incumbent upon us to keep pushing that conversation and to, you know, bring it to our community so that we can amplify voices um, that, that we know, right, that we see in communities and uh, give people the space to do that should they choose to, uh, but to keep it going publicly. And they're not saying that Camila and Nadia are inventing this conversation, right? We're not. We're not inventing it. This is not new. We're just doing it in a public space and inviting people to be a part of it, uh, to join this conversation, because it, it is one that deserves amplification. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the health of our community depends on it. Um, the health of, you know, Black Muslim women depends on it, right? Like, as many people as possible um, should be amplifying this message and not just saying, oh, there's a problem, but like here are people that are doing work um, that, you know, is well-intentioned work, that is good work. And these are the reasons why they're doing it. Um, Because I firmly believe (laughs) Like I said, if you start at equity, right? If you start with the goal of closing gaps, um, then you will see improvement across the board. And so in Muslim communities, that frankly starts with Black women. Um, And so I have no qualms about intentionally focusing um, the work that I do on Black Muslim women. And acknowledging that I still have a long way to go in getting that um, to look like I would like it to look, mm-hmm. right? And to make sure that I am responsive as I intend to be, um, but that I'm bringing that framework to the work that I do and to, to, and to this conversation. Um, and yes. <laughs> And, and because it needed to be had at heart, right? Um, it needed to be had. And so I'm, 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 I am um, super cool with you being willing to have it. And we are very happy to have it. Um, I know we're, cl- we're closing in at the end of our time, um, but uh, there's one thing that I realized as you were talking is we never – actually define the difference between equality and equity. And I think that that could be a really interesting, you know, um, thing to just discuss. And then, you know, uh, talking a little bit about if there's any real life examples that we want to bring into the space about community led um, organizations or um, initiatives that have been successful before we close and and move on to the next conversation. Right. So the difference, the difference between equity and equality lies in the focus, right? Um, it's the outcome versus input that either reinforces or challenges existing inequities. So there's like the graphic that I'm sure everybody has seen and kind of hates by now of the yeah. kids trying to see over the fence and the boxes that help them. Um, and in one, you know, you have everybody given the same box and that is equality, right? And then some people still can't sit over the fence. And then equity is giving people the tools that they need in that 
in this case, the boxes to see over the fence. There is a much more recent example um, that I like a little bit better that is uh, people on bicycles, right? People of different abilities and being given the bike that fits in order for them to move forward. Um, but it's about the focus. So equity um, and the way that I'm using it, health equity is closing gaps um, and, in, and making, um, well, designing uh, targeted interventions that are meant to close gaps. Right. So it's not giving everyone the same thing and hoping that, you know, one size fits all and it works um, because interventions like that may actually make improvements. Right. So everybody's line is moving up, but you may still have um, disparities in how uh, people experience whatever that problem is. So equity is giving different groups what they need in order to um, close those gaps and in order to, you know, uh, address whatever challenge, whatever health problem it is. It's giving them what they need. So the difference is the focus. Thank you. Um, great. Um, did you ha um, want to share any examples of community-led uh, initiatives that are successful in your eyes, that are, you know, um, are thinking about equity in the right way and thinking about health in the right way? Um, so one that we talked about um, was Sister Song and also Sister Love. Um, and they're both based in Atlanta. They're both uh, reproductive justice organizations and they were both led by black women. Um, and Sister Love in particular uh, has a long history in the West End of Atlanta, um, which is the Black Muslim community that I grew up in. Uh, and Dazan, who leads Sister Love, um, taught classes in, in that community. Like her purple house <laughs> was uh, not very far from the masjid. Um, and she was, she's not Muslim, but she was really grounded in uh, the West End community. Uh, and I always looked at her and the work that she did uh, with Sister Love as a model of how to do community engagement right um, and how to fit it to the community that you are enmeshed in, right? Um, so it was this mix of people, um, you know, kind of Afrocentric you know, black people, you had like black nationalists and then you had black Muslims and this mix of people that only people who are from Atlanta and from the West End will really get, but this like mix of people, right? And I, and she was kind of in the center of it, doing this um, work focused on HIV and AIDS um, at a time when that was not really popular to talk about talking about, you know, sexual health um, at a time when um, those conversations were not as prevalent in those communities. Um, and she was doing it um, from her perspective, you know, and with respect to all of the cultural and religious kind of sensitivity swirling around. And so, when I was in school doing my master's in public health and, and she taught a class and, and our class was in that community, right? So for me, I always took that as like a model of how to do um, work that was intentional in its focus, right? Like you knew exactly who she was targeting her work to, Black women, right? No bones about it. Um, that was healing centered um, and that was intersectional in different ways um, when it needed to be without losing the main goal um, and without kind of watering down what it is that she uh, was trying to do. So that's an example that, you know, 
that I always kind of look to when, when trying to um, figure out how to do community engagement. Yeah, I actually, I really love Sister Love. Uh, they, and incidentally, they just celebrated their 30th anniversary uh, or 30th birthday, however you want to call it, um, uh, just this week. So happy birthday to them. Um, and Sister Song too, I, I've been to their Let's Talk About Sex uh, conference. Uh, and the, you know, I've been to a lot of national uh, sex ed conferences and uh, Let's Talk About Sex is by far my most favorite uh, conference in just the lens that they take in um, talking about sexuality. And again, you know, healing, it's healing centered, it's intersectional, it's unapologetic, is acknowledging, you know, the deep history of this work um, that has been going on for a long time. And also the deep history of this work in terms of how it's impacting uh, black women in particular. And so um, I've always appreciated being in that space and learning um, from those communities as to really what community-led in initiatives look like. And I think first and foremost, it's just being able to see, you know, uh, for you uh, in your, um, what I heard from you in your reflection about Sister Love is just being able to see yourself reflected in, in that work, um, you know, in, in the numerous ways that it's being done. And it's, it, it is, like I said, it, it made an indelible impression on me and it is a beautiful thing to see, um, to see folks who look like you, right? Um, who look like you, who talk like you, who move like you, um, and who are concerned about you. Um, for me, that has always been what drives me and what makes me feel successful is to see that reflected in other people mm -hmm. um and to see you know people who care very deeply about your well-being um not in a patronizing way um, not in a like, I know, you know, I know better than you and this is how you should be living type of way, but in like, we're community, right? We're community, which means we're family, which means that if you are hurting, then I'm hurting. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way that we heal is if we do this together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are the conversations that I'm interested in promoting. Uh, and there is a ton of work to do. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a ton of work to do. Absolutely. Doing it. Um, I am like doing a very small part compared to what people do. Right. Very tiny part. But I, um, have, I have made the decision that when I'm given access to platforms like this, then I won't, um, I won't belittle what I know. Mm -hmm. And I won't belittle what I can bring to the conversation, um, that I will show up fully as Camila. Um, and then I will also, you know, give, give shouts out when I can. I will acknowledge other people that are doing the work um, successfully and are, are modeling um, what community engagement should look like. Yeah, and I, just, to, just to add one last thing about what you were saying about being able to see yourself represented, um, you know, that's what a lot of people have shared with us in, in the work that we do at heart is that, you know, because they're able to see themselves represented, that in and of itself is healing, right? That in and of itself to see yourself reflected in this work. And as you said, somebody who's genuinely caring about you and your well-being and your ability to feel empowered and informed and and you know really thrive uh, that in and of itself is is an act of belonging and an act of healing for for many folks so when we say healing centered it doesn't mean that you know there's this like I mean sometimes there is you know sometimes there's uh, a lot of healing elements that are brought into spaces but it doesn't always have to be that way. You don't have to get the massage therapist and get the, you know, all of that to, to feel like you are engaging in that healing in it, like just inherently the fact that the work is led by people who look like you is in and of itself 
often what people are looking for to feel like they're that they get a sense of healing and not just look like you right like um because i think uh in this day and age we have to make a distinction that it's not just people who look like you it's people who are you Mm -hmm. right um because they can look like you and be doing you harm so it's people who are you who look like you who talk like you um and they're not the feds <laughs> like, like they're not the feds they're, they're uh well-intentioned people so i just gotta say that because that's yeah. super important yeah absolutely <laughs> thank you so much camila this was a lovely conversation uh and we're excited to uh share this with um the internet um, and uh, we hope that the next few conversations you all can also join us for. Uh, we will be in the next conversation, we'll be exploring, as I mentioned earlier, the historical context of healthcare delivery um, and uh, Black communities and communities of color. And then also specifically looking at what is the history of Black communities and uh, particularly Black and Indigenous communities with the healthcare system. And why do communities of color delay care? Uh, and, and, you know, really thinking about, um, about some of those nuances and, and, um, and situations. Um, so thank you. Uh, and we hope that you all join us again today or next time. (laughs) Next time. Thank you. Thank you.